Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to ask that you're for listening to us on our website, that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. I'm joined today by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate, and Dylan Palman, executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at Acton. This week, we've got a potpourri episode for you with a grab bag of different topics. So let's just dive in with the end of Title 42 at the border. So Title 42 was a measure implemented under the pandemic emergency powers that the federal government had that basically expedited the return across the border of people who entered the country illegally, people who follow uh, border stories and what is happening with uh, illegal immigration in the country closely will know that one of the problems wrapped up in that system is if you enter illegally and you are caught up when you're entering illegally, you'll get a court date and you essentially get released into the country. This is one of the larger problems. Again, if we just want to have respect for a system of justice that is going to handle immigration, illegal immigration in particular, uh, a lot of those people do not return for their court dates. It's not hard, no matter where you come down on whether we should have more immigration, less immigration, whatever, to see the problem in the system that is created there. Title 42's implementation, again, with the pandemic powers that the federal government had, basically allowed people within the same day who were caught crossing into the country illegally to be turned around and sent back to uh, across the border into Mexico. The point that I would just like to make is uh, there was a lot of panic that I saw around this because it is going to return the United States to that dysfunctional system that I just described. But this is where I think people have kind of lost the thread, which is the pandemic from the perspective uh, of the federal government and at least a lot of, if not the vast majority of the powers that were assumed by the federal government in March and April of 2020, we've acknowledged the pandemic has ended. And the federal government and a lot of state governments, um, although I would like to note that uh, uh, the People's Republic of Illinois, where I used to live, I believe Governor Pritzker is still operating under pandemic powers. So it has not gone away everywhere. But on the federal government level, the pandemic emergency powers have essentially been relinquished. So this was, to me, necessary to end because the pandemic was the reason for its implementation. And how we do these things matters. It, whether or not you think the regime under Title 42 was better than what we have without it, the justification for its existence no longer exists. So if, you know, to, to mount my hobby horse very early in this uh, podcast episode, Congress needs to act. If you want a policy that looks like Title 42, then Congress needs to act to empower that, not have it done through emergency powers for an emergency that I think we can all agree, I hope at this point, is long over. First of all, I wonder, you know, what are they doing so poorly in Illinois that they still haven't gotten the best in this pandemic? It's something about the policy must be off, uh, that they're still stuck in containment. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I look at this and a lot of people on the right who are anti-immigration were very worried about this, that people are going to start flooding across the border. Uh, it's going to be this big uh, you know, mass illegal immigration um, happening. And I don't really think people who are coming here and desperate are paying that much attention to pandemic emergency policy in the United States. I think they're going to keep coming at about the same rate as they always have. Um, on the other hand, um, I also don't think people realize that Joe Biden, as far as I know, is not like an open borders guy. In fact, on almost every point, he's 
taken very similar kind of economic policy to former President Trump, um, and including other things like policing. I remember there was a town hall uh, in 2020 where Trump was asked about policing. He said, you know, there's just a few bad apples. And then at the debate uh, with Biden, Biden, before Trump could say it, said, you know, there's just a few bad apples, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, he just like preempted uh, Trump's whole line. And then in at his first State of the Union, he says, we shouldn't defund the police. We should fund the police. So it's the exact opposite line of, you know, radical people on the left. Um, and I think the same is true of in- immigration. I don't think Biden wants a big border disaster. And I don't think he's going to let one happen other than the fact that our immigration system just as a whole is a disaster and it will continue to be exactly the disaster it always was. So um, economically speaking, we have a problem with birth rates in this country. We Our population is not growing at the rate it should. And one of the things the United States has been great at doing historically is making up for that with immigration. And immigration is great because you get able-bodied adults instead of just babies, right? Um, so you, in, in terms of supplying your workforce and increasing your productivity as a nation, immigration is great. It's, you know, it's arguably you know, better in the short term. Um, but we have such a Byzantine and poorly designed immigration system that it's basically impossible to have any kind of rule of law. These are unenforceable laws. They, the wait times are too long. Um, as you mentioned, the procedures are are crazy and that will arrest someone, will let them go. They won't show up for the court date. Um, in other cases, uh, this happened you know, even before President uh, Trump's time uh, during President Obama, but they would catch people at the border. They're separating people from families, sometimes separating children and parents. They'd also, they've run out of space in detention facilities. So they're shipping illegal immigrants further into the country to hold them at detention facilities in other states rather than border states. Um, Just everything about it is backwards and messed up and needs a huge major overhaul. Uh, But unfortunately, it's this political third rail that uh, there's a kind of populist uh, anti-immigration Sentiment on the right and left, I think, uh, to some degree, um, at least the blue collar left. Um, and everybody, you know, nobody wants to campaign on that um, and nobody wants to actually do anything about it. As no big surprise, Congress doesn't want to do anything about anything. Um, so I would expect some kind of executive action rather than Congress doing anything. And that executive action will probably look quite a bit similar to what we're already doing at the border. So maybe that's a bit cynical, but that, that would be my expectation. So for... Months, maybe years. I would echo John Lennon saying the pandemic's over if you want it. Um, But now, like, we have it. Like, the World Health Organization has even come around and said pandemic's over. Um, The justification for these policies um, on those grounds, as Eric said, is is completely out of order at this point. And it's right that this should end. Now, there are challenges in – Border enforcement. There's no question. We have an extremely long, extremely challenging border with our southern neighbor involving deserts that poses a danger not only to uh, <clears throat> migrants themselves, but also Border Patrol and Customs Enforcement. Is this, this is this is a challenging geographic landscape and they certainly need um, an array of tools in order to do their job. Correctly, What we've seen, however, in the United States is that we're generally seeing lower levels of immigration uh, for quite a while now through the, the past two administrations. Um, so while those challenges remain, they're less acute than they have been even in recent memory. Um, so you've got, you know. Comprehensive immigration reform seems to be something that politically no one wants to touch, as as Dylan has touched upon. And uh, you got a situation where Customs and Border Patrol are increasingly stretched in doing this enforcement. And it doesn't help when the media comes and reports on these and brings out the wide angle lenses and provides the public with a misleading impression of what's been going on. There are individual situations, migrations, caravans, where you do get a lot of people coming all at once that can overwhelm Border Patrol, Customs Enforcement, and local areas. But overall, this should be a time in which it is easier to act 
to resolve these questions because we have seen now generally lower levels of immigration than we have in the past. And it's a shame that that nobody seems willing to take that political initiative. I, I want to make two points and then I, I think we can uh, move on to the next item from our grab bag. Uh I heard an interview with George W. Bush, a former president, uh, who made the point because he was one of the presidents under which there were these efforts to come up with some comprehensive immigration reform package. And um, I know that this is a uh, I have a lot of opinions that make nobody happy. Um, This is one of my opinions that makes nobody happy. I honestly think we would be in a better position despite all of the disagreement with certain elements of those comprehensive immigration reform packages that were hated by the left and particularly by the right, um, we would be in a better position if any one of them had passed. Uh, in as, you know, as uh, incomplete for addressing the actual problem as any of them would be because they were compromised legislation, um, I think we would be in a better position. Uh, but he made the point that the, he thought that it was on its way to getting passed. And the person that he faulted and the person who asked him the question was trying to set him up to take a shot at the populist grassroots right. And it's not where he went. He said the uh, the person most responsible for comprehensive immigration reform not passing while he was president was Chuck Schumer, uh, the leader, uh, the Democrat leader in the Senate, because uh, they desired the issue of immigration as a campaign political issue more than they desired the solution or anything to address it. It, uh, I think we see this with a number of issues that they are more valuable to have as issues than to actually address them in a meaningful way. The other point that I want to make, and I will put this in the show notes, uh, Reason Magazine did this really great flowchart a few years ago. And to me, this is uh, this is critical to understanding the, the immigration, particularly the illegal immigration problem, because if we don't do something to address the incentive structure that exists, we are going to continue to have these problems. If you are an unskilled laborer, somebody looking to come to the United States, I hope you've got about 125 years on your hands because that's the approximate wait time to come to the United States legally through using the, I believe, the headline uh, that goes along with this flowchart is what part of legal immigration don't you understand? Uh, And it walks you through all just how labyrinthian the immigration system actually is. And until we make it a way that, you know, and we there can be other conversations about how many people we want to welcome. But until the process itself gets simpler, clearer, and more logical and accomplishable, you are going to have people who are going to not want to wait 125 years, of course, beyond the lifespan of the average person, to try to find a way to come to this country and build a better lives for their families. God literally has a time limit that he institutes after the flood in in Genesis, that, you know, man should not contend more than 120 years. And we're right there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on now to uh, there's a couple of stories we're going to cover in this grab bag that I just absolutely love. Um, this is one of them. The Anarchist, which is Toronto's anti capitalist cafe, is permanently closing. Uh, the good news if you're listening to this and you're in Toronto, the closing date is May 30. 2023. So you still have a few more days to get your uh, anarchist cup of coffee. Um, It described itself as an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial cafe shop and radical community space on stolen land. I think they need to work on the brevity part of the marketing pitch for this uh, coffee shop. It first opened back in March 2022 uh, and offers all the beverages and baked goods you'd expect to find at a cafe with a side of radical books, art, stickers, jewelry, clothing, and tote bags. The part of all of this that I found, and there's uh, there have been other stories of similar cafes to this, of the pay what you want or pay what you can. I think there was like a Panera spinoff somewhere in the United States that did something pretty similar to this. Of course, none of them have been able to last very long. And for the reasons that I'm sure we will get into that, you know, the underlying economics of the way that these kinds of things work are actually important. But the part of it that I found absolutely Delightful. Um, I'm looking right now at the Yelp page 
for this coffee shop. Um, they are closed, actually. So if you're listening today or to, tomorrow, they're closed Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so you're just out of luck there. Um, but on no day of the week are they open before 9 a.m., which I find to be the time that people most desire coffee is earlier in the morning. Uh, it, this is just this this thing is a pinata. Like you can hit it from any different direction, and you're going to get some kind of reward. Um, but I just the desire of people who would write that kind of mission statement for a coffee shop to want to exist outside of the laws of economics and discovering that they cannot exist outside of the laws of economics. You know, it's it's one of those great relearning things that, um, you know, that Edmund Burke quote, that example is the school of mankind and he shall learn it no other. Maybe somebody will learn from this example, and I sure hope they do, that if you're going to serve coffee, maybe it's a good idea to be open before 9 a.m. Yeah, I mean, one thing about... Uh We've we had something in town very similar, and you know you see these things cropping up where it's basically food service, but then they try to make it you know a kind of communist co-op worker cooperative sort of thing where everyone has a share of the profits and that kind of thing. And um, I mean, I say go for it. Uh, you should, probably should be open before nine a.m. Uh, if you're selling coffee. You know, you make sure you have some sense of the market for the product you're trying to sell. Um, but this is a world and an economy in which you can try those things. Um, but when I think people have discovered, uh, maybe they're not willing to admit it, is that most people who are looking for a food service job are not looking for this to be like their forever career. Um, they And they aren't showing up to the job interview because they're like, this is the perfect encapsulation of my principles. They're showing up because they want a job and they want a paycheck. And we have a system for that. Uh, and it's called a normal labor contract where you, you work and you get paid and you go home and you don't have to worry about, oh, no, is the restaurant or coffee shop I'm working at doing well? You just get paid. And, you know, if it, if it goes under, it goes under. But you're going to get paid the same amount because you agreed to a rate that isn't based on whether or not the – establishment profits. Um, and that's a good arrangement for most people. Most people are fine with that. Um, so I think there's a miscalculation. There might be some sorts of business in which this is more appropriate. You know, maybe a highly, you know, creative cooperative, like a, you know, group of artists or something like that um, might have better success, right? Um, you, you group together, you pitch yourself to, you know, the upper class who are looking for, you know, custom art and that sort of thing. And now you're giving them more choices. So, you know, there's, there's ways in which collect, collectivizing one's efforts um, can actually be beneficial and sharing the profits could also work. You know, one artist maybe has a good season and helps subsidize the other ones. And then, you know, it's someone else's turn where suddenly they're the, they're the hot thing, whatever. I can imagine ways in which that makes sense. Um but like bagels and coffee are not it. You can get that anywhere. You can get that for free in a lot of places, apparently at some of these places, uh, but also like some ministries. You know, I know of a, a, a Christian coffee house here in town that's kind of like a ministry. And the whole point is just to get people in off the street, get them a warm cup of coffee and like maybe you get to talk about Jesus with them. Right. And so it's subsidized by donations because it's part of a ministry. It's a nonprofit. Um, but you you know, there are other models for accomplishing what they want to accomplish. Uh, at the risk of restarting the how do we pronounce bagel dialogue, I'm just going to let uh, your uh, pronunciation of bagel there slide, uh, Dylan. We but pronounce I do... bagel correctly. Yes, yes. Uh, you also say pop up here, which is crazy to me. Um, I do want to read the statement from the, uh, I don't want to say owner, because that's probably uh, too colonialist for the uh, proprietor of this establishment. Uh, the statement uh, the anarchist has been a huge success in every way I had hoped and has given me so much inspiration and education that I plan to put to use in future projects. Unfortunately, the lack of generational wealth slash seed capital from ethic, 
ethically bankrupt sources left me unable to weather the quiet winter season or to grow in the ways needed to uh, be sustainable longer term. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Pop Coffee Works, my coffee supplier and landlords for their generosity and patience. They could easily have sold the space or rented it for more than twice what they've charged me, so this place wouldn't have existed without them. Again, just want to note what's buried in there is apparently the massive discount that they were getting from a landlord or at least under market value, according to the the proprietor of this cafe, that allowed them to be uh, in operation for as long as they were. Again, I go back to my point. It was like you can uh, you can pretend the the laws of economics don't exist, but at the end of the day, you know they're they're going to come back and bite you. I mean, if you're getting discounted rent on stolen land, are you morally <laughs> culpable? Like you're not the owner. There, there's a lot that feels like it's unexplored to me in uh, in in the thoughts of this uh, proprietor here. So there's a great scene. In the Breakfast Club, the John Hughes classic, and the great the my, the greatest scene is not between any of the high schoolers, but between the janitor and the principal. And the janitor t- is talking to the principal, and he says, "You know, you thought you thought teaching would be great. You'd get summers off, and you know you'd be set. And then it turned out to be real work, and that really bummed you out." And whenever I see something like this, I'm reminded of that scene because there are businesses, thousands of businesses across this country and across the world that operate as cooperatives. I used to go to a health food store in Hillsdale County when I lived there that was co- was run as a cooperative Um There are coffee shops that are run on this model. There are whole categories of businesses called nonprofits. I am working for one as we speak. Hey, me too. Yeah. Um, There are different ways of doing business, of organizing business to best suit your needs, your ethical convictions. They're out there on offer. But there are fundamental sort of principles of accounting, profit and loss, basic sort of employee, human resources management, all of those sort of nuts and bolts, organizational things that actually look very, very similar across these classes of businesses, despite for-profit, non-profit, despite, you know, owned by a single proprietor, a publicly traded corporation, owned by workers, all of this, you know, the way you shuffle around the equity and the way you shuffle around um, how policies are decided, there's a wide variance there that can be more or less suitable for different industries. But the nuts and bolts of dealing with people, dealing with customers, dealing with creditors, dealing with account holders, all of that remains the same. And if you don't do it right, no matter how you're organized, you're going to have a bad time. And that's what this looks like to me. Let's move on to our third topic. Uh, I am going to read a a tweet here, and of course we will apologize to our listeners for this being uh, Twitter-originated discourse that uh, we are going to talk about. Um, But I I think it is worth discussing, and I'm also not going to use the name of the person who tweeted this uh, for two reasons. One, because I think it was primarily attention-seeking, and two, um, because when you say this person's name out loud, it sounds a lot like mine, and I have been deeply disturbed by that since this whole online discourse uh, about this started. Um, Here is the statement. Acceptable occasions to wear yoga pants alone in your house with your husband, working out alone in your private gym while your husband watches you. The end. No public venues, not social media. This started, uh, as I noted, um, and again, we apologize for the Twitter focus, uh, a whole lot of conversation about the concept of uh, modesty and whether or not this uh, opinion on offer here was a reasonable one. Um, so I will, I will throw that open. Just is there, uh, it, is it acceptable to wear something for women, to wear something like yoga pants out in public, or should we even be concerning ourselves with this kind of thing? No, no one should care. Um, 
<laughs> I'm not saying the modesty doesn't matter, but I am far more concerned with the perspective of this uh, esteemed tweeter. Um, Who I should note is a um, uh, a Christian pastor based in Utah. Oh, even better. Um, so, A, you know, it, it's the sort of thing that the, you see this a lot of time, especially with this kind of issue. Um, there's a guy wh- who uh, faces temptation and for whatever reason does not have the self-control, has not developed uh, the ascetic habits and disciplines needed to develop that, um, to do anything about it. Uh, and so instead he externalizes it. Yoga pants should be banned because he can't stop staring at them. But apparently it's okay to stare at a woman in yoga pants if she's your wife. Seems kind of creepy even if you're married to her, frankly, um, just to sit there and stare at her. Um, I, I just want to note again, like that third <laughs> statement that I read in the uh, the original post here, working out alone in your private gym while your husband watches you. Like the inclusion of that last clause is bizarre. Yeah. Um, so look, we have these things, they're called... Uh, ascetic disciplines, prayer, fasting, almsgiving. If you're upset about yoga pants, look at your own heart. All right. I'm not saying, you know, people shouldn't also dress modesty, mod- mo- modestly. Modesty is a virtue. It is something people should care about. I have no opinion on yoga pants in particular, whether or not they do or don't cross a line. Um, I think it's just nothing I can do anything about. All I can do anything about is me by the grace of God. Um, and so go to confession. If you're part of a tradition that has confession, um, get, get some help, um, get some icons around. Uh, if you if you have images that are leading you to temptation, find images that lead you to sanctity. All right. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do something about this. And none of them are that ban it with the force of law and the violence of the state. Um, That's ridiculous, and it's not going to happen, thankfully. But also, you should probably change your reasoning and your priorities and your entire perspective on life. I also include in the show notes um, a a tweet thread from this uh, apparently very controversial person on Twitter who goes by the name Derek Guy. The handle is Die Workwear, um, who is known mostly as just the menswear guy on Twitter. Um, Again, going through the history of different things that within just menswear – uh, are completely acceptable now. Like he goes through the evolution of the T-shirt um, and how that would have been considered very risque. It includes even a screen cap of uh, Marlon Brando um, cemented the T-shirts association with masculinity, effectively burying any memory that the T-shirt started as women's underwear. Uh, today, the T-shirt is a unisex garment and is pretty common in public life. And I think just does a real good job of pointing out some of the, even you can go back in time long enough to where men wore incredibly tight pants. Um, the, the evolution of fashion over time, uh, one, it changes, and two, people have always had their critiques of it, uh, which in, makes... Ones like this just seem, I think, particularly unhinged to me, but that's just to me. So Dylan Dylan covered, I think, some of the ethical ground here very well. Um, I'm going to cover some of the yoga ground as I actually have a yoga practice. Yoga pants I know more about than any man should as a result. <laughs> um, and there's an, there's an interesting history here because there is no – Yoga attire. In in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna some things about the context to practice yoga. And he says, you know, in chapter six, to practice yoga, one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusa grass on the ground and then cover it with deer skin and a soft cloth. The seat should neither be too high nor too low and should be situated in a sacred place. The yogi should then sit in the in very firmly and practice yoga to purify the heart, controlling the mind, senses, activities, one-pointed attention, etc. What's interesting is that the husband is not there watching first. <laughs> this is a secluded place. Um, the other thing is is that um, yoga pants are tight, and yoga asanas involve a whole range of movement. And so I think tight-fitting clothing, when you're trying to do big, full-range of motion things, is a bad idea. Um, this, is, this is 
and this is something that in the history of yoga practice, what happens is yoga gets introduced to the West. And we ruin it, right? No, no. Yes. We, 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 <laughs> Western, women, Western women are like, what do we wear to do these exercises? And they think leggings. And so they, you know, begun, you know, wearing leggings to class. Now, BKS Angar, one of the great uh, yoga teachers of the last century who introduced many uh, yoga practitioners in the West to the practice, his uh, wife came up with uh, these sort of shorts that are sometimes called puna pants. They're sometimes called yoga bloomers. And they are loose-fitting shorts that have an elastic waist and have uh, sort of elastic or drawstrings around the legs. And the idea is you keep the leg uncovered as much as you can in, the, in terms of modesty in order to get full range of motion and to also allow an instructor to see how your musculoskeletal body is aligned. And uh, you have it so you know, there's enough room in your pelvic area along your, your sacrum and all of that, that that is not and around your hips, that it's not constricted. So what I would like to see is less yoga pants discourse about modesty and more yoga pants discourse about whether these are even good for yoga. Because if they're not good for yoga, there might be a place in leisure wear for leggings, these sorts of things. But I hate to see yoga get dragged into this when this is none of yoga's business. <laughs> uh, that was we, we may have to have a new uh, just yoga dedicated segment of this podcast because that was, uh, that Yo- was fantastic. Yoga Watch. Yo- <laughs> yoga Watch with Dan Huger. <laughs> Gentlemen, let's move on to, I think, my favorite of these uh, grab bag potpourri stories of the week, La Sombrita. Uh, I am going to read from a uh, piece <clears throat> at the Cato Institute from Paul Matsko. Los Angeles spent $200,000 on La Sombrita, uh, translation, in the shade, for those of you who don't habla espanol. A bus stop shade slash light structure <clears throat> that provides little shade or light. It has been almost too easy to criticize its design, the token DEI framing given to the project, how most of the funds went to a global junket for the designers, or the fact that the city officials held a tone deaf celebratory press conference for its unveiling. Would this make, quote, uh, make waiting for the bus at night feel safer to you? There's an image, again, we'll include the link to this, where you can see uh, the amount of light. That is generated by this thing, which is uh, solar, uh, small solar panels at the top in order to collect uh, solar power and then light it at night is uh, laughable. Uh, It might be helpful if you were about um, six foot eight uh, because the light doesn't seem to filter down very well. You can't even really see the person standing beneath it. Um, But the best part is that it, it looks like to me, again, from the pictures, that this piece of metal, which is really all it is. And I would like to note again what Paul Matsko notes in the very beginning of this, $200,000 and three years to develop this bent piece of metal. Uh, Apparently, nobody thought about the fact that the sun is in different positions throughout the day, which means the shade that is going to be cast by this is going to move. So standing directly underneath it doesn't actually really help all that much. But the part of all of this you really have to get into to understand, like, okay, so why are they coming up with this thing? Because it is almost impossible to be able to install actual bus shelters at any of these locations, which I think this story, hilarious as it is, and again, you have to see the pictures to truly appreciate the rank hilarity of this whole thing at the cost, again, of $200,000 and three years in development, again, with all the things that Paul Matsko at Cato there lays out, is just how many veto points there are for even the simplest development of infrastructure if it is done by a public entity like the city of Los Angeles, that it is almost impossible for us to build anything. I remember these commercials that used to run 
for MSNBC a few years ago. And the one that always stuck with me was with Rachel Maddow standing at the top of the Hoover Dam talking about how, you know, America is a country that builds things and like infrastructure and yay, you know, like we should all love this. And there's just no recognition whatsoever that it would be virtually impossible to build the Hoover Dam at the same speed and pace that the actual Hoover Dam was built. It would turn into a 15-year project that necessitated labor relation negotiations with multiple labor unions. It would be double the budget that was proposed, twice the actual timeline. And if you don't believe me, there's an example of this in Chicago where I used to live. The same year that my son was born, they started the work on the Jane Byrne Interchange, which is where a couple different expressways come together just to the west of the loop in downtown Chicago. It was supposed to be done, I believe, in four years. My son is nine. They just finished it late last year. It was well over double the budget, I believe, took twice the time, and just like with La Sambrita, they held a press conference to congratulate themselves on a project that was over time and over budget. And it's a reminder of just how hard it is to build things. Now, you would never get the Hoover Dam built now, and there's just little recognition of that. This whole thing is absurd as it is should serve as a reminder of how a lot of our urban problems are, you can trace back to the fact that it is just very hard to develop now in urban areas, even under the auspices entirely of the state, because it's the city of Los Angeles that is responsible for the difficulty in building actual bus shelters and have come up with this just preposterous, quote unquote, solution to the problem that uh, I think we should all be able to get a hearty laugh at, but it underlines and underscores a much bigger problem that somebody really should deal with. So we call it La, La Sombrinks in my household. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, how dare you gender a gendered language uh, and call it La Sombrita. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a mess. The, so there was a, a picture I saw of it. At, le- at night. So one of the defenses they've tried to make of this is, well, it's cheaper than a typical bus shelter, which not necessarily. There's easy comparisons uh, to show that that's not accurate. But um, but they say, well, it provides light at night. And I, and my understanding is it's one of the, the gendered angles uh, for defending it under these DEI sort of things is that, you know, it presumably should make the waiting for a bus safer for a woman at night. Um, but the light is up so high that it is darkness below it, like below where the light runs. Like it would be perfect lighting for, as you mentioned, like a six foot eight mugger, but not the like five foot four woman who's supposed to be protected, right? I mean, it is it is amazingly ineffective and obviously so. And it shows, you know, this weird tone deafness of the city of LA that they're going to congratulate themselves on this. Uh, to get an idea, so uh, my 11-year-old recently got the new Zelda game, uh, which uh, is blowing up. It's crazy. Sold 10 million copies in the first three days. Um, 10, 10 out of 10 reviews all across the board. Uh, but of course, that means that I got the new Zelda game and I've been staying up too late playing it after everybody goes to bed. Uh, and it's great. And there's all kinds of videos already. In fact, within like the first day, there are videos and there's this feature. It's Zelda's about, it's a fantasy game. You got a sword and a shield. You're trying to save a princess. Um, but they, they've keep adding elements over the years. And so in the newest one, you can manipulate objects and make machines. Um, you can, you know, you have wheels that turn, you have steering wheels, you have rockets, there's all sorts of things. And even just like simple machines, uh, you know, like literally like a wedge and a, you know, a board, you can make a, a launcher and that sort of thing. And people posted videos and they do amazing things. Somebody built like a working, you know, robot with lasers that they can walk around with in this, this game where you're supposed to be running around with a sword and shield. Uh, there's flying machines, all of that. So I'm like, oh, this is great. I can't wait to play it and try it out. And then anytime I make something, it's, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I, this is going to be great. And then it just like flips over and, and nothing happens. And, you know, you can find whole videos of people failing. And this, it just reminds me of like somebody having this great idea. Like I can build a bus shelter. Like I can build my own hovercraft in the new Zelda game. Uh, and then you build it and it's, it's just 
you know, incredibly disappointing. Um, and you're like, well, this is why there's professionals that do this sort of thing. This is why, um, this is why we have people that know how to do this rather than just any old person doing it. Um, I will say, uh, Maybe a way to save money would be to first design it in the new Zelda game because you could make a bus and you definitely could make a bus shelter. Um, and you could even make a replica of this very, very terrible bus shelter they have in L.A. in the new Zelda game, complete with the light and everything. If anyone wants to do that and tweet it at me, I would love to see it. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's a mess. It's it should give people pause um, to really think about what is going on here, who is is responsible and why can they not be held accountable for this? Like there is something structurally broken about LA. I mean, this should not be news to anybody, but structurally broken that this is the kind of results you get. Um, These people, the people that this is supposed to be built for deserve better. The citizens of LA deserve better for their tax money um, and from the people who are supposed to be representing them. There's a, I mean, if you look, you know, If you look at the great builders, if you look at people like Robert Moses and Boss Tweed, um, there's downside to that. Um, There are, um, you know, neighborhoods that are ruined. Those are populations that are moved. There's all sorts of uh, there's all sorts of consequences to ambitious building. So I think I think it's important to keep that in mind. But there's also so sort of ideological commitment. We did a an acted on wine some weeks ago in which we talked about what Ezra Klein has called everything bagel liberalism, where the idea is that you have to satisfy all constituencies under all circumstances. And this is the end product of that is ultimately these decisions involve trade offs. And if you are unable to get them. You will get La Sembrita. It reminds me of the joke of uh, the the camel as a horse designed by a committee. Um, it, 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 which of course also reminds me of the great quip from Thomas Sowell that the lowest form of intelligence known to man is a committee. Uh, it again the the amount of people that were surely involved in the creation of this thing, and for nobody again at any point to point out like, does this even really do what it's supposed to do? Um, but it, it's the it's the, the the hubris of not just going ahead with it um, again at the two hundred thousand dollar cost, which we should note is like a rounding error in the buddy, uh, budget of the city of Los Angeles. Um, but you know, two grand for that over three years is just a, a great reminder of how ineffective. Um, local governments and state governments, even the federal government, can be at creating these kinds of projects that don't even end up actually serving the end. You know, it's one of those things if, yeah, it may be too expensive and it took too long, but if it actually does the job that it's supposed to, maybe we can forget a lot of that. You know, another Chicago-oriented example, you know, at least, again, the, the one I gave. People can get on and off the different expressways. Um, it took too long and it was way too expensive in order to do it, but it actually works in the end. Uh, Millennium Park, when they built that in Chicago, took too long to build it, cost more money than they thought it was going to. Beautiful park on the other side of it. But on the other side of this, you have La Sombrita, which is not doing the job that it is supposed to. And, uh, well, at least it gave us this great moment of levity. And it made my week last week, at least once I got past the point of, staring at the picture and trying desperately to figure out what I was even looking at. I had no idea what it was or even even when somebody explained it to me of like the I don't see how it does the thing that people are claiming that it's supposed to do. Uh, I thought there was something wrong with me. Uh, Turns out, no, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, The whole project is some kind of uh, a joke. Call me crazy, but the social responsibility of bus shelters is to provide shelter (laughs) for people waiting for the bus. Uh, Sadly, we see the failure there. Uh, I want to close the podcast by noting uh, the passing last week of uh, Tim Keller. We had just published, and we will include this in the show notes for this episode, um, a book review uh, about uh, Tim Keller uh, by Stephen Presley, uh, Engaging the Culture for Christ is the title of that piece. It's a biography of Tim Keller, uh, incredibly influential pastor, um, the 
pour outpouring of uh, tributes to him um, after it was announced that he had passed have been uh, incredibly moving. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that we uh, acknowledge that and, and talked a little bit about um, the the influence of of Tim Keller. So there was a great obituary uh, by Daniel Silliman at Christianity Today, um, where he he gives you know really the whole course of Keller's life uh, from you know, pastor to professor to then church planter in New York City. Um, one of the things, uh, it's someone who um, I'm not myself um, Calvinist, but I've been educated at several Calvinist institutions. And I've certainly been aware of Tim Keller and his work. Something that really stood out about him is uh, his his heart for ministry in urban areas that other people had given up on. They just said, you know, people go to the city and they stop going to church. Um, and so we're just going to focus on the people who do. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, you know, those people need church too. People out in rural areas or suburban areas, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but so do the people in the city. Um, and Tim Keller found a way to make that work uh, in the PCA uh, with a Redeemer um, in New York City um, to the point where uh, it became this huge thing, especially after 9-11. Uh, he, it, his church was just flooded with people. Uh, who came in and while well, he didn't, of course, maintain the immediate levels of attendance, his attendance like tripled after that and um, just continued to grow. Um, and, you know, he did things that I, I remember I went on a, a missions trip uh, or a, it was it was a, a music trip. We were playing uh, music at different churches, uh, but we went to New York City and we visited the offices of Redeemer. And I remember how weird it was that like the offices were in a different building up on the 15th floor or whatever, you know, but that's what you do in an urban setting. You find the space that's available, you lease it, um, you make it work, and it's going to look a little different um, sometimes than what people might think. Uh, you know, within his tradition, it's able to look quite a lot bit different than, say, uh, Roman Catholic or Orthodox like myself. Um, but still, um, he he did a great thing there. And another thing he did, and I think it's not um, coincident or not not incidental to his success, is he stayed out of politics um, as much as he could, to the point that some people were calling him a socialist. They were, you know, he's someone who cared about civil rights, but he wasn't going to politicize um, from his books or from the pulpit. Um, and I mean, we're, it's weird that he's accused of being so left wing because uh, he also was protested from the other way when he uh, received the Kuiper Prize years ago for the, the Kuiper Conference at Princeton Seminary. Um, people were upset about that um, from the left. Um, but he's a guy that, that he just cared about the gospel uh, as he understood it and telling people about um, the, the reality of Christ's death and resurrection and the possibility of forgiveness and redemption. Um, and it turns out when you put those things front and center, um, there's power behind it. Uh, you can find that success. Um, and, and when you do so in a responsible way, I would add. I mean, he was not someone who was just going in without any kind of prudence. Uh, he uh, had a lot of learning behind what he did, a lot of intelligence and foresight. Um, and he was able to, you know, he, like I said, he had been a pastor already, so he had had his first go at things. He had made a lot of mistakes. He had learned from a great community there. Um, and so when he went into New York City, it wasn't his first rodeo. Um, he was, I believe, like 40 years old, something like yep. that. Um, and, and you know, really left a legacy that, that hopefully should, should give people hope for people and communities uh, that others have written off. Uh, and I think that's a, a wonderful legacy for someone to, to leave behind. Just to develop something that um, Dylan mentioned um, that uh, first uh, on uh, Princeton in the Kuiper Prize, one of the interesting things, I mean, you get these stories about speakers getting, quote unquote, canceled on university campuses and, you know, outrage and that sort of thing. And when there was resistance to having Tim Keller speak at Princeton, um, and in fact, he was not awarded the prize at Princeton as a result of this controversy, which had to do with his attitudes towards sexuality and gender, which are pretty standard conservative Presbyterian attitudes towards Just sexuality and gender. Traditional Christian. And uh, <laughs> women's ordination, which is, again, a very traditional... Um, Keller could have handled that in a number of ways, but what he ended up doing was going to Princeton anyways and delivering those lectures anyways that he had planned to without the prize, which I think speaks to his general attitude and convictions that he had something 
to share with those people. And he didn't need a prize to be the occasion to be there and send that message. Um, Dan Silliman, in his obituary that uh, Dylan noted, uh, sort of the lead pull quote at the beginning is a quote from Keller um, that he evidently was very fond of saying, which says, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That was the message that Keller led with in, in, in all contexts. And I think that's a, that's a legacy um, very much worth appreciating. Let's call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look right now in the show notes where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only so that more people can find this program. I want to note that there will be no episode of Acton Unwind next week because of Memorial Day. Thank you to Dan. Thanks to Dylan. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.